the song leader, the preacher, we're ready to go. Good evening. It's good to see you this evening. Take a songbook, turn to number 900. 900 will be our first song. Probably be on the screens behind me as well, but uh, this way you get a preview of what you're going to sing in just a moment. A few announcements as we are about to get started. Many of you, most everybody here I think knows Benji and Cherie Slocum. Benji's the preacher over at Shannon. Uh, they have been caring for one of Cherie's multitude of sisters, Cheryl Sinkfield, the last few uh, weeks and months. Cheryl, who worked at Sam's in Jonesboro, many of you know Cheryl, uh, passed away last night after a struggle with cancer. So if you would, keep the Slocum family and all of their uh, relations, Cherie's family, in your prayers. Uh, several of our, of our folks also here Need an interest in your prayers. Tom Durden Sr. is currently at the uh, ER at Piedmont Fayette. He was briefly in the hospital at Spalding last week and went home, and now he's out there. They're trying to figure out uh, what's going on, probably going to go ahead and admit him overnight. So keep Tom Sr. in your prayers. Uh, Deceta Lyons also is, is still struggling with some things, so keep Deceta in prayer as well. Jill Nash was hospitalized briefly this past week. Uh, for a heart issue. She's back home. She's still awaiting some heart uh, procedure, uh, uh, some kind of treatment this month. And David, her husband, is still struggling with shingles, so keep the Nashes in your prayers. Forrest Chapman had a, a minor surgical procedure this past week, but he was able to be with us this morning. And Larry Fields is still at home. He's doing well recuperating from his latest heart trouble. Uh, he may still have to have a couple of valves repaired, so keep Larry in your prayers. A couple of upcoming activities tonight after the evening service. Teen Sing will be at our house, so keep that in mind. Uh, young men are supposed to bring two liters, and young ladies are supposed to bring uh, a dessert or some chips. Uh, got tickled talking to Catherine Hopkins. She said, when I was that age, I always resented that the, the boys just got to go grab a drink, and we had to bring dessert. Now I have three boys. That's great. <laughs> See, what goes around comes around, doesn't it? Next Sunday is New Picture Sunday after the morning service. Uh, new members of the congregation and anybody that has been here but wants a new picture in the, the pictorial directory online and out on the picture board, please meet Donna Hagen on the front porch after the morning service, and she will take care of that. Next Sunday evening is our banquet celebrating love hosted by our youth. It's for all members of the congregation. If you plan to attend, Please, please, please sign the sign-up sheet in the corridor on the youth bulletin board. We need to have a, a, an accurate guesstimate, at any rate, of how many people to prepare food for. Keep in mind the church office will be closed on Monday the 18th. That's not tomorrow, but a week from tomorrow. It's President's Day. And the wedding of the season is coming up, March the 2nd. The marriage of David Gulledge and Kristen Nash. 1 p.m. on March the 2nd, Berry College, Frost Chapel. Everybody is invited. Please remember Camp Inagahee's Heart of the Matter Capital Campaign that kicks off today. You can participate in that. You can see Greg or any one of the elders. Your help would be very much appreciated. Elders, do you have any other announcements that we ought to pass along? If not, then let's begin our worship in prayer. Would you bow with me? Eternal Father and God, thank you for the kindness that you show us day by day. For the love and the patience you exercise toward us, we give thanks to you. And we come now into your presence to express our appreciation and our gratitude, to beg for your blessings to continue upon us. Father, we thank you for your church and particularly for the body of your people that meets here at Fayetteville. We pray that you would help us to love one another, to support and encourage one another in everything that's right, and to correct those things that are wrong. To always share the blessings and the message of salvation and hope that you have given to us with those around us. And we pray now that as we begin our worship together, that the songs that we raise to you, the prayers that we lift up before you, the message that's brought to us, that all that we do would honor you and glorify you and lift us up to be the people you want us to be. We thank you, Father, for Jesus, for the sacrifice that he made, and we give thanks to you now and ask these blessings in his name. Amen.
it's so great to be here to be able to come and worship you tonight. We know that in so many places in the world, that's not something people can do willingly or without fear of molestation. So the living in this wonderful country that we live in, we're great, so grateful for. There's so many things that you provide for us that we sometimes take for granted. But there are those of us who are always looking forward to that time where we can learn more about that word. So this is one of those opportunities. We take this special moment tonight to pray for Sister Kathleen and for Brother Larry, that while they're struggling with things, they'll be able to get it. I want you to look over Jill and David as they struggle through to continue help. I know all these people have been struggling so long, and I know they get frustrated at times, but if you could just bring some light into their lives, uh, hopefully some, that they'll be able to find the solution to these problems. We're also grateful this time to be able to have such a wonderful leadership of this congregation that strive continuously to try and make those things that will be an honor to you here in this community and throughout the world. We ask that we as your members and your, your followers that we spend some time trying to learn more and to be able to share more with those that need to hear the message. We're so grateful for those that have had successful surgeries in the last couple of weeks. We also pray for Andy Johnson, and we pray for Brother Dern, uh, that they be able to recover from their situations and that they'll be able to continue to grow and strong and be able to get back and do those things they want to do. Again, we thank you again for all this that you've given us and the leadership that we have. And for we thank you very much for both David and Dave for the messages they continue to bring us, and they always be strong examples. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Take a Bible and turn to Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5, I'll meet you there in just a minute. I know you're looking at the screen and you're looking at that question. 
And if you were to ask me that question, I would tell you that you needed to be more like Kristen Nash. It's Valentine's week. I got to get a head start. If you would ask her, she'd probably say, don't be like David. How can we be perfect? I want you to think about that question as we begin. I want you to think about it, take it in, and, and we're going we're gonna to answer that question, and I hope by the time we get to the end of this lesson, you understand what it means, and, it, and hopefully it's not too intimidating for you. How can we be perfect? Because the way that we define in our English language the word perfect, the way we define it, the definition, is without defect, no flaw. And so we think about that in our life, and we say, well, I, I can't live up to that. That's impossible. And we hear people say, you hear preachers and teachers say that anything short of this perfection, anything short of that is short of being what we need to be. And so we walk away with that discouraged outlook of, I can't live up to God's expectations. He wants me to be perfect, and that's impossible. And so if this is the way you think, let me give you some problems that that mindset produces. The first problem is that it disregards the actual meaning of the word perfect in the Bible. You see, our word perfect and the Bible's word perfect are two different words, and they have two different definitions. So if you're using the modern-day English definition of the word perfect, of course you're going to be discouraged, and you're never going to live up to that. And so that mindset disregards the actual biblical word perfect. The second problem that arises is that it teaches us that some of the things that God expects, we can't do. And so what kind of God would tell you to do something that was, again, impossible? God says, do this, and as a human being, I can't do that. Well, that's a problem, and God doesn't do that. The third problem that comes with this kind of conclusion is that it leaves us feeling forever inferior because we cannot be what we ought to be and fulfill this mold of perfection. And so let's not think about it from the modern English definition of the word. We're going to go to the Bible and see what the Bible says about being perfect. You can be you need to be. In fact, there's a passage that we're going to turn to in Matthew 5 that Jesus says, depending on your translation, if you do things, you will be and you must be. And so this is something that you need to accomplish in your life. And so if this is your mindset tonight, I hope to change it. Or if you have the opposite mindset, that this is something you know you can do, I hope to reinforce that tonight. In our, our text, Matthew 5, and this is the very last verse of Matthew 5. This is the Lord's Sermon on the Mount. And, of course, when it was originally written, it wasn't divided into verses, but if you were to divide it as we have, and this is the very last verse of chapter 5, the Lord says, Therefore, you shall be perfect just as your Father in heaven is perfect. And so the Lord has just finished describing something. That's why he says, therefore, he's coming to the conclusion. Therefore, you shall. So he just finished telling his disciples something, and then he attaches to that, if you do what I just said, therefore, you shall be perfect. And so I was taught in preaching school, and it's just good uh, Bible 
um, it's rightly dividing the Word of God, you've got to keep verses in the context in which they are written. And so what is it that the Lord just said here in Matthew 5 that makes us perfect? Well, in Matthew 5, starting in verse 43 and 44, the Lord taught something that was pretty radical. You know, we think uh, about other religions like the Muslim religion as being radical, and, and there are extremes, and there are radical Muslims, but the Lord taught some things that were radical too, and by that I just simply mean that they were completely different than any of the world had ever heard. They were a much higher standard. They were, they were things that completely changed your life. These were radical teachings, but the Lord said in 43 and 44, "...you have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy." But I say unto you, love your enemies. Wow, that's, that's challenging. That's difficult. That's hard. Don't just love those that love you and hate those that hate you. Jesus says, love your enemies. Bless those who curse you. Do good to those who hate you. And pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you. So this is the context of what the Lord's talking about. Love your enemies. This is something they haven't heard before. We hear it all the time in our world, but are we actually practicing it? It will change your life. It'll make you perfect. He goes on in verses 44 and 45 to talk about how love has moral, ethical, and spiritual implications. This is something that you ought to be doing because God does it, because it's just the right thing to do. God, in verse 44, um, or verse 45, that you may be sons of your Father in heaven, for He makes His Son to rise on the evil and on the good, and sends rain on the just and the unjust. God treats everyone equally. God doesn't spare the rain from the evil person's garden. It rains on theirs as well. You treat people the way God treated people, or continues to treat people, the good and the evil. You love your enemies because that's something that God does. And what good is it if we love those who reciprocate that love? You love the people that love you in return. What good is that? Jesus taught in 46 and 47 to love those who, who don't even deserve it. For if you love those, in verse 46, who love you, what reward do you have? They already love you. Do not even the tax collectors do the same? And if you greet your brother only, what do you do more than others? So if Christians practice this rule of only loving people that love us, how different are we than the world? The world already does that. Politicians already do that. Liberals already do that. Atheists, evolutionists, they already do that. They love those that love them. And so Jesus says, what makes you different if you do this and you don't love those who are your enemy? That's what makes you different and set apart as my follower. You see, this is radical. This is different. This is, this is demanding. This is challenging. But then, in verses 45, and we've already noticed that as well, but then he concludes, Therefore, when you practice this kind of love, it's the exact same love that God has. God loves the good. God loves the evil. He treats them equally in that he sends the rain on both. He, he allows the sun to come up and to shine on both. He doesn't show partiality. And so in Matthew chapter 5, the very context, Jesus is saying, if you develop, you see, it's not a natural love. If you will develop this type of love in your life to the point that you actually love your enemies and you pray for those that persecute you, you do good to those that hate you, if you as a person actually develop this in your life, 
Verse 48, Jesus says, Therefore you shall be perfect, as my Father, your Father, Heavenly Father, is perfect. You will have the same kind of love as Jesus. Before we go any further... I want to just notice the parallel, because I think, you know, if you compare accounts, one gospel will say something that the other gospel doesn't say, and it just kind of opens your eyes in, in a different way. So go to Luke 6, and I'll go there and read it for you, but in Luke chapter 6, 35 and 36, this is Luke's account of the same uh, occasion here with, with the Lord in Matthew chapter 5, but Luke 6 35 and 36, Luke says this, But love your enemies, do good, and lend. Lend things hoping for nothing in return. So when you give, don't expect something back. And your reward will be great, and you will be sons of the Most High. Here it is. For He is kind, God, He is kind to the unthankful and the evil. What? He's, he's kind to the unthankful. I mean, what if you gave something to somebody and they were just unthankful about it? How would you treat them? Well, I'm never going to help them out again. Luke says in his account, God is kind to the unthankful and the evil. That's just a different uh, gospel there and a parallel that I thought was interesting. But let's continue on this thought. Let's think about the biblical word perfection, and then we're going to go into some other questions that I think will, will describe for us this idea of Christian perfection. But perfect means, in the Bible, to reach a higher standard. The very moment you decide to be a follower of Christ, you immediately set yourself to a higher standard. You can't go back to the world standard. You can't. When Jesus said, if any man will come after me, you then set yourself to a higher standard. You live differently than the world. You let your light shine, your salt, you're different. You have a higher standard. That's why we read in several passages, but in Romans 12 and verse 2, be not conformed to the world to the world be not be do not be conformed to the world but be transformed you see you got a different standard than the rest of the world and and a lot of that dave dealt with this morning on what it looks like to be a christian you, you have a different standard when the world looks at you perfect means to be complete as opposed to being partial you're, you're complete in first corinthians 13 there Paul, writing to the church of Corinth, talks about how when he was a child, he spoke as a child, he did things as a child, he acted like a child, but when he became uh, an adult, when he matured, he put away those childish things. And then he continues on to say to abide in hope and, and, and love and, and mercy, and, and the greatest of these is love. You become complete and perfect. You become complete and perfect in love, and, and you are complete as opposed to partial. But then number three, there's a, a third idea of being perfect, and it means to be loyal. If you're perfect, you're loyal to God. If you're a perfect husband, you're loyal to your wife. If you're a perfect wife, you're loyal to your husband. The same is true with God. Perfection, perfect, carries with it the idea of being loyal. Let me read a passage for you in 1 Kings 11 and verse 4. You're going to get two examples in this passage. Take both of them and learn from both examples. For it was so, when Solomon was old, that his wives turned his heart after other gods, and his heart was not loyal to the Lord his God. So there's the first example of Solomon. His heart wasn't loyal. He wasn't perfect. The very last part of that verse, as was the heart of his father David. Solomon wasn't perfect in the sense that he allowed his wives to lead him away to idolatry 
and he became unloyal. David, it says, was not the case. David was not perfect in his actions all the time, meaning that he had flaws. He had defects. He sinned. He murdered. He committed adultery. But he was always loyal to God. Perfect in the Bible means to be loyal. So three definitions there. It means to reach a higher standard. It means that you are complete as opposed to partial. It means that you are loyal to God no matter what. And so with that hopefully in your mind, let's ask four questions, and we're not going to deal extensively with these questions. I hope that these questions are basic enough that you'll understand them and you'll come to the conclusion at the end of this les lesson whether you're perfect or not and whether you need to be perfected in Christ tonight. And so let's ask these questions. Thinking about how can we be perfect? How can you? Well, number one, do you have a devoted heart? You say, well, I got a good heart. I didn't ask if you had a good heart. Do you have a devoted heart? Are you completely, unconditionally, no strings attached, 100% devoted to everything God? In Psalm 119, now I'm going to read from the uh, American Standard Version because it's, as far as I know, the only translation that uses the word perfect, and that's what we're going for here. The other translations carry the same idea and the same meaning. I just wanted to use the word perfect uh, for our study tonight. Psalm 119, 1 and 2, thinking about a devoted heart. The, uh, the psalmist says, Blessed are they that are perfect in the way. Who? All right, he's about to describe those that are perfect. Who? Walk in the law of Jehovah. 1 John 1, 7 and 9. Walk in the light, as he is in the light who walk in the law of Jehovah, blessed are they that keep his testimonies, that seek him with a whole or devoted heart. Do you have a devoted heart? Or are you on the fence? Are you devoted on Sundays? But are you undevoted on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday? Throughout the week, you know, works hard, I know. You, you, you know, preacher, you don't really understand what I deal with. You're right, I don't. But I know that no matter what you face, others have faced it. Those in the Bible have faced it, and yet they have remained faithful, and they have remained devoted. And so do you have a devoted heart to God? That is... One step to devotion or to perfection. Now let me give you three examples just quickly for your mind's sake to think about. In Genesis 6 and verse 9, when God was going to destroy the world with a worldwide flood, he looked down and he saw a devoted man by the name of Noah. You can be a Noah. In Job 1 and verse 1, you know the account of Job, how he was tempted and tormented and and. Uh, diseased and lost everything that he loved and owned, but yet he remained faithful to God. Job is a great example. And then going back to 1 Kings 11 and 4, we've already looked at David and how David was loyal to God. And hey, they had a devoted heart. You see, David was not sinless, but his heart was nonetheless devoted to God. And so, do you have a devoted heart? Look at your heart. You know it. If not, you need to be devoted. That would be step number one. Question number two, are you grown up? You say, I've got a devoted heart. That's a good start. Are you growing? Too many Christians, they become a follower of Christ. They're baptized, and they never increase. They, they just stay where they are. They don't mature. And so are you growing up? This is where I would say a lot of Christians stop. They say, yeah, I've got a devoted heart. Okay, are you growing? Hmm. What do you mean by growing? Hmm. You know, like, this is where it stops for a lot of people. So, what does the Bible say about growing? Well, 
In 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 6, and that's just one that I have on the screen for, for your sake, but we have many more that we could consider. But 1 Corinthians um, 2, rather, 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 6, Paul says, However, we speak wisdom among those who are mature, mature Christians. This idea of going from milk to meat. You're a mature Christian. He says, we speak to those that are mature, yet not the wisdom of this age, nor the rulers of this age, who are coming to nothing. There's just one example of Paul using that word, mature, a grown Christian. Same book, 1 Corinthians chapter 14. 1 Corinthians chapter 14 and verse 20. Brethren, do not be children in understanding. However, in malice be babes, but in understanding be mature. You see, you've got to go from being a babe to being mature. You have to. If you stay a babe too long, then you become stagnant. You're not growing. Anything that becomes green and stops growing begins to die. Any plant that stops growing dies going from milk to meat. Let me give you a few more for, for uh, just, just study's sake tonight. Ephesians chapter 4, verses 10 through 15, and we won't read that entire text, but Ephesians 4, 10 through 15, uh, he says, He who descended is the one who ascended far from above the heavens, that he might fill all things. He gave uh, and he himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, and some pastors, and some teachers, for the equipping of the saints to the work of the ministry, and to the edifying of the body of Christ, till we, um, till we all come to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to a perfect man, there's our word perfect, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, that we should no longer be children, perfect, no longer children in Christ. Listen to what he says, no longer children. Here's a good description of a child in Christ, tossed to and fro and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by the trickery of men, in the cunning craftiness and deceitful plotting. But speaking the truth in love may grow up. Are you growing? You can continue reading on all through there. Um, really to the end of the chapter. But that whole idea in Ephesians of, of growing, you can go to Philippians 3 and Colossians 1 as well, and they all carry with it this idea of growing. Let me give you two examples or two categories before we go to the next question. First of all, sometimes Christians individually, sometimes Christians are not spiritually mature. In Hebrews chapter 5, in Hebrews chapter 5, and starting in verse 14, Paul says, But solid food belongs to those who are of full age, that is, those who, those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. Solid food, the meat of God's Word, belongs to those that are of full age, those that are growing. There's some individuals who are not mature and not growing. There are some congregations as a whole. Congregations can also not be growing and can lack spiritual maturity. In 1 Corinthians chapter 14, you probably know what is said here, but in 1 Corinthians 14 and in verse 20, this is where we already read this. Brethren, do not be children. He's writing to a whole congregation. Do not be children in understanding. There's whole congregations that can be immature and babes in Christ. So are you growing? Growing in Christ makes us Perfect. And let me say this, you'll never get to a spot, a point in your life that you need to stop growing. 
You'll grow until the day you die. I remember one time whenever I was young, I'm going to chase a rabbit here for just a minute and then we'll get back on our, our lesson. But I remember whenever I was young, 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 and I went with my dad to a nursing home to visit a man who he lived to be 100. I can't remember how old he was, was when we went to visit him. His name was Pepal Blakeney, um, and elder, lived to be 100 years old. He talked about how he was 10 when the Titanic sunk. And I just remember this man in my mind. He was just so outstanding. He was like 98, 99 when my, my dad and I went to visit him in a nursing home. We walked in, and he, he was laying on the bed, over in the corner was a table with a Bible. It was open. He was asleep. We woke him up when we went in to visit him. And my dad, just in conversation, said, I see your Bible over there open. And see why Blakeney, we call him Papa Blakeney. Papa Blakeney said, laying there on the bed, and he's been a Christian his entire life. Well, he, when he became a Christian, but he grew up in the church, was an elder. He said, I read the Bible every day. And I've done it my entire life. And every time I read it, I learn something new. And if a man who was about to be 100 years old can say that, it's going to be true for every single person. So there's never a point in your life that you stop growing. So are you growing up? Question number three. Are you complete? In order to answer this question, you've got to think about Christ. In John chapter 4, and verse 24, Jesus talks about something that was not complete, something that he came to finish. In John 4 and verse 24, Jesus talking to uh, a Samaritan woman said that um, John 4, sorry, that's not 34, PowerPoint's wrong, verse 30. For dropping down. Then he said, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. That word finish indicating something that's not completed. And so are you complete? Well, Jesus talks about something that's not complete yet. In John 5, next chapter, verse 36, he says almost the exact same thing. John 5, 36, but I have a greater witness than John's for the works which my Father has given me to finish. So the Lord was perfect, of course, sinless, but he came to finish something. Now, what was it that the Lord came to finish? Well, Hebrews 2. We'll find our answer. Hebrews 2. Verses 9 and 10. But we see Jesus. Can you see him? His birth, his life, his baptism, his ministry, his death. For we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels, meaning that he was placed on earth. For the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that he, by the grace of God, might taste death for everyone. So this is the work that he in John 4 and John 5 was talking about. He came to finish it. This is his work. That he might taste death for you and for me. Verse 10, For it was fitting for him, for whom are all things, and by whom are all things, in bringing many sons to glory, to make the captain of their salvation perfect through what? His suffering. So are you made complete? The only way you're made complete is through his suffering. He came to finish something so that, yes, you could be complete. He suffered and he, and he died and he was made um, a little lower than the angels, and he finished it to make you complete. Let me give you one more passage, and that's just in Hebrews chapter 5, a couple of chapters over. Hebrews 5, 8 and 9. Though he was a son, yet he learned obedience by the things which he suffered. And having been perfected, he became the author of eternal salvation to all who obey him. 
he was perfected through his suffering so that you could be perfect through his salvation, which he brought to you through the cross. And so are you complete? Well, another question is, are you in Christ? One final question. Have you been perfected forever? That's an interesting question. Go to Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 14. Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 14. For by one offering... Can you imagine being under the old law? Sacrifice after sacrifice after sacrifice after sacrifice. How many lambs? How many, how many animals were sacrificed over and over and over and over? Hebrews tells us, for by one. He was offered once. For by one offering, he has perfected forever those who are being sanctified. If you're being sanctified, if you're being justified, if you're being cleansed by the blood of Jesus, which continually works in your life, if, if you're in Christ, you're perfected forever. Such cannot be said to those that are outside of Christ. They're not being perfected forever. Only those that are in Christ. But then after the perfecting of the soul, there still remains one more perfecting. And in Philippians chapter 3... Philippians chapter 3. There's one more perfecting that's going to come. And Paul talks about that to the church at Philippi that he longed for. He couldn't wait for this perfecting. Philippians chapter 3, verses 11 and 12. If by any means I may attain. And that word attain there means arrive at. If I may attain or arrive at to the resurrection from the dead not that I have already attained or am already perfected. I'm not already perfected, he says, but I press on. That I may lay hold of that for which Christ Jesus has also laid hold of me. Paul here is referring to a perfecting that is yet to come, and that's the resurrection from the dead that will happen to all those that are in Christ. When you're changed and you're glorified and you're made to be like him, and there you will be, perfected forever. And so three questions, four questions tonight that will help us answer the, the question, or, or how can we be perfect? Number one, do you have a devoted heart? Number two, are you growing or are you grown up? Are you maturing? Are you going from the milk to the meat? Number three, are you complete? You're only complete in Jesus because he makes you complete. And it is his suffering, and it is, it is his blood, and it is his death that makes you complete. Everything that he went through, are you in him? Number four, have you been perfected forever? That, again, is only found in Christ to those who are being sanctified. And then there's a perfecting that is yet to come whenever the soul will meet the Lord in the air and he will be as uh, we will be as he is and we will be perfect forever. But let me read one more passage and then the invitation is yours. In Hebrews chapter 12, there's just so much that the Bible says about being perfect. I had a hard time putting it all into this lesson, but we're going to close in Hebrews 12 again in verse 23 talking about that perfecting that is yet to come. Hebrews 12 and verse 23. To the general assembly and church of the firstborn, who are registered in heaven. If you're a member of the church, you're registered in heaven. This is what he says. And to the blood... Nope, that's verse 24. To God, the judge of all, to the spirits of just men made perfect. Your spirit will be made perfect in Christ on that day that is yet still to come. And so there is no need to leave tonight feeling like you've got to meet a standard that you can't meet. There's no way that you need to leave tonight feeling that God has asked you to be something and do something that you just can't do, no matter how hard you try. 
And when you sin, there's no real need to beat yourself up to the point that you feel like you can never attain this perfect life that you feel like you need to attain. That's not what the Bible describes as far as perfection. And so are you perfect, and how can you be perfect? I hope that we've answered that question tonight. And so how can you be perfect? Well, first you need to put on Christ. The invitation is yours to do that, to be baptized, have your sins washed away, to be added to the Lord's church. And He makes you perfect. If you're here tonight and that's what you need to do, you can do that. Or maybe you've wandered away, you've fallen away, and you need to redevote yourself tonight. And ha- let him make you perfect once again. You're perfect only in him. And if you're not in him tonight, you need to be. He's waiting for you. Will you come as we stand and sing? We've come to the portion of our worship where we remember what Christ has done for us, that we might have a hope of salvation. Let us pray. Dear gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your Son and his willingness to die on the cross. Please be with those that are about to partake of the bread as it represents his body. It's in Jesus Christ's holy name we do pray. Amen.
If you'll bow with me again, please. Most gracious and loving Heavenly Father, we come before you again giving thanks for this fruit of the vine, which represents the blood of our Savior. And Lord, as we partake of it, we ask that we do so in a manner that is pleasing and acceptable unto thee. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Separate and apart, we're also commanded to give. Let us bow. Once again, Heavenly Father, we come to you thanking you for all the many blessings you bestow upon us each and every day. Please, Father, at this time, be with those that are about to give back. Give back with a pure heart and not begrudgingly. It's in Jesus Christ's name we do pray. Amen. pray with me. Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. We come to you tonight thanking you, Father, for this day that you have given us to worship your Son. We thank you, Father, also for the fact that you gave us your Son and for the sacrifices that he made for us. We ask you tonight, Father, to be with our military and our first responders and our police officers. We ask you to be with those who work here in our church our preachers that bring us the word, our teachers that teach us, and those that worship regularly and help us. We ask you, Father, to go with us now through the remainder of this week, the number of days that you have given us. We praise you in all things, and we offer this prayer in Christ's name. Amen. <clears throat> 